The need for kidney transplants increases yearly as end-stage renal disease rates grow. A patient who suffers from renal disease is at higher risk for premature death and their quality of life is severely impaired. Dialysis, which is a process of replacing kidney function through the use of a machine, removes waste and excess water from the blood. While dialysis is a life-saving treatment, it is cumbersome, requiring patients to be hooked up for long hours several times per week. Patients with kidney disease dream of a life-changing event, a kidney transplant. Doctors in Manitoba's leading kidney transplant program have pioneered research in early detection of kidney rejection. This groundbreaking research has resulted in increased numbers of successful transplants. Organ matching is not as difficult as you might think, yet many patients, particularly women, still must wait years for the gift of a donated organ. On this episode of Doctors Care, we'll learn about Manitoba's leading kidney transplant program and about how each and every one of us could save a life. Originally from Argentina, Dr. David Rush arrived in Manitoba in 1981. He's now the Professor of Medicine at the University of Manitoba and the Director of Transplant Manitoba Adult Kidney Program. The kidneys are, of course, uh, vital organs. Uh, they help us stay healthy by performing a variety of functions, the most important of which are regulating the uh, composition of the blood. And because the composition of the blood bathes all the tissues, the tissues, every tissue in the body, is uh, improved upon in structure and function because of the actions of the kidney. The kidney filters blood and then reabsorbs exactly the amount of every chemical that we have uh, in order that the various tissues uh, are, let's say, nurtured appropriately. It also regulates uh, blood pressure. It also is an endocrine organ because it makes uh, a hormone that stimulates the bone marrow to make blood. And uh, it also makes vitamins such as vitamin D, which are important for bone health, for the immune system has anti-cancer properties, etc. So when people get ill of their kidneys, they get ill quite uh, seriously and in different ways. It's interesting to me that there are two kidneys and yet people can obviously survive with just one. Yes, yes, uh, this is uh, not, not my particular design, but I'm grateful that people have two kidneys because without two kidneys, there would mean, of course, no living donor transplantation of kidneys. So it's uh, a good thing that we're born with two. Jennifer LaFerrier first began having problems with her kidneys when she was just 14 years old. With careful monitoring and regular potassium intake, Jennifer was able to delay dialysis until after her second daughter was born. For the past three years, Jennifer has received her dialysis at home. It pulls my blood out. It runs through the machine, through the filter that, that's the dialyzer, it's like a kidney. It takes all the toxins and stuff out and then it returns my blood back to me and it does this over and over for the six and a half hours that I do it. And uh, you were saying that it's six and a half hours at the night time and four and a half hours during the day? Um, well, yeah, because it's, it's harder to do a long treatment during the day. So yeah, I usually, I try to do six and a half every second night. Every second night? Yeah, I need the night off in between to just kind of recover from it. Now you have a connector here in your shoulder that just yeah. stays there all the time. All the time. It, right here, these disconnect here. This is always with me. Jennifer has been on a waiting list for a kidney for four years. Yeah, I'm just waiting. I haven't had a call yet. Dramatic improvements in post-operative drug treatment programs mean that finding a compatible donor can be easier than it was in the past. The donor can be a friend or a distant relative and the organs can be genetically dissimilar and still be successfully transplanted. The greater the incompatibility, the more medications we, we will have to use with the attendant risk that uh, goes along with that. But the transplants can be done. Even if you have a zero match between donor and recipient, the transplant can be done and the benefits that we talk about, transplant over dialysis, still occur. But this is not to say that we shouldn't look for the most compatible kidney 
uh, if we have that option. However, because Jennifer has had two pregnancies, it is more difficult to find her a match. When a woman is pregnant, she builds up antibodies to the foreign genes of the father. Dr. Rush refers to this as the gender inequality in kidney transplantation. You have a lot of antibodies then, you, you wait longer, which is why, again, for the same reason, women wait longer than men, because they have been exposed through pregnancies to other people's genes and have developed antibodies. So women, in a sense, are a minority that's disadvantaged. In the meantime, Jennifer waits. It's been 16 years since I've really lived a normal life. Jennifer's daughter Carly can hardly imagine what life would be like if her mother was to receive a kidney transplant. Just to, to know that she could live a normal life, is, I know that's what she really wants and I think that would be the best thing for her. And it would be great to see that happen. Manitoba's kidney transplant program is justifiably proud of a number of innovations designed to improve the odds of a successful kidney transplant. You've been a pioneer when it comes to early detection of uh, kidney rejection. There are innovations that have occurred and uh, I don't think there's ever been a dull moment or a moment where there was something not uh, terribly exciting and novel uh, going on in the 30 years that I have uh, uh, practiced transplantation. Early in his career in the program, Dr. Rush encountered a patient whose transplanted kidney suddenly stopped working. We did a biopsy of that patient and we found that the kidney was uh, virtually completely destroyed. And if you looked at the patient's uh, trajectory from the laboratory point of view, there was no clue as to what, uh, what was happening in the kidney. From then on, protocol biopsies were taken at regular intervals for all transplant recipients. In those days, this was the 80s, so uh, 90s actually, 10 years after I came, uh, we found that up to 30% of patients were actually rejecting their kidney in a silent way. With newer medication, the need for these biopsies has decreased, but it has, uh, having done those biopsies and found uh, the, what we described as subclinical rejection or silent rejection, has uh, led people to realize that the response against the kidney, the rejection of the kidney, occurs in very subtle ways, very early, and it's, that, uh, it's at that time that we have the greatest chance to improve on the survival of the kidney if we make that diagnosis at its very early stages. So you find that early on that the kidney is, uh, is, is not doing well or is being rejected, and then you can jump on it right away and start treating right, it. Right, before there's structural damage, because first there's inflammation that doesn't cause any damage to the kidney, but if that inflammation persists in the kidney without treatment, it will eventually, eventually damage the structure of the kidney, and it's too late then to, to cause any change by treatment. While regular biopsies have dramatically improved transplant outcomes, it's a somewhat invasive procedure. Another innovation being pursued by the Manitoba Transplant Program is the development of a simple urine test. Dr. Julie Ho works on the transplant team on both the clinical side and in the lab. Many people are familiar with uh, pregnancy uh, dipsticks where you can buy them over the counter and you know you pee in the stick and if it's positive you go see your doctor, okay well you think you're pregnant. Well our goal would be to have a dipstick for rejection or for other types of kidney problems that transplant patients may experience so that they could self-monitor at home. It's particularly relevant for Manitoba where you have a very rural population um, and it is very difficult for them to come in uh, so far to see us in transplant clinic. So if there's ways that we can monitor non-invasively or people can self-monitor at home, it may actually make a real difference to the life of transplant patients. Is that unique to Manitoba? Um, the work that we're doing, um, some it is unique to Manitoba, certainly. There's, um, it, it builds on a literature of work, so nobody ever does research in isolation. I think we really build on um, work that has gone before us. So. Another research focus is schemer perfusion injury. All kidney transplant patients, um, when they get a new kidney, essentially the kidney comes out of the donor and it goes in a bucket of ice until it gets into the new one. And at that period where there's not blood flow going through the kidney, going through the kidney, there can be damage to the kidney depending on how long it sits on ice. And that's what we can call ischemia or perfusion injury. Um, and so I'm trying to look for markers that may um, 
identify people who may run into troubles because of that low blood flow. Dr. Peter Nickerson is a clinical nephrologist. He obtained his MD in internal medicine and nephrology training at the University of Manitoba, and then attended Harvard Medical School through a transplant research fellowship for four years. In 1996, he returned to Manitoba. We knew going to the States that we had a position back here at the end of the training, which in some ways takes a lot of the stress away and it allows you to just uh, take the job and uh, do your work and then Coming back here, you know you have a good group to come back to, so that made it also very easy to, to come back to Manitoba. Not everyone who needs a transplant necessarily goes on to dialysis. So if you have kidney disease and you're approaching the point where you need to go on dialysis or have a transplant, if you have a living donor, it could be your child, it could be a friend, right? Any of those individuals uh, can be a potential living donor for you. So, you know, we look uh, broadly for a living donor and the reason we do that is we know that if you have a living donor transplant it's a lot easier it's more because it's not in a crisis situation we can time the transplant we can optimize everything and because the kidney is out and back in so quickly the uh, amount of injury that that kidney sustains in coming out and going back in is minimal um, those transplants on average everything else working out well will last 20 years 16 20 years on average in the case of the deceased donor, it may take longer to find a compatible recipient. And while the kidney is carefully preserved in ice, transplanted kidneys from deceased donors do not tend to last quite as long. Those kidneys on average used to last only eight to 10 years. Now we're out to the 15 to 20 year range as well, but we always do better with a living donor because dialysis, while it's, it's life-saving, is still hard on your system. Uh, and we know that people, once they're on dialysis, their life expectancy is shorter than if they were to have a kidney transplant. So, for example, a young child uh, on dialysis might expect, on average, to live another 20 years, but if they have a transplant, their life expectancy would be 30, 40 years. Uh, so we're starting to approach normal life expectancy uh, at, a, at a young age if you can get a transplant early. So, so we want to have short wait times if you're eligible for a kidney transplant, which really means uh, that we have to have a sufficient number of donors available to be able to do the transplants. And that's really our biggest problem. Here at the south end of the Assiniboine Park Conservatory is the Garden of Life, which symbolizes the chance for new life that's possible through organ donation and transplantation. I encourage you all to go right now to signupforlife.ca and then share the fact that you've done so through your own social networks. Together we can make a real difference in the lives of those courageous people waiting for a life-saving transplant. Julia Kurowitz and Helen Ferens are sisters. Little did they know growing up that one day Helen would be called upon to give Julia an extra special gift, the gift of a new kidney. In the spring of 96, uh, our father passed away and I thought I was going through a depression. You know, we were all sad about the occasion and uh, then uh, I thought, better see a doctor, I'm not feeling that great. And before I know it, I was in emergency and on dialysis. My immune system apparently attacked my healthy kidneys and uh, now they weren't working. Julia was on dialysis for six years. I had to go three times a week for four hours a day. I tried to do as much as I could in a normal sense, even though I had dialysis, and I had to do the other stuff because I had children. Uh, my husband and I had a business. We had to continue on with life. Over the course of several years, Helen faced the decision of whether or not she could be a kidney donor for her sister. First attempt, I had um, three kids under the age of two. Um, my sister had young kids as well, so we kind of uh, elected to hold off on a little, little bit. 
Uh, then my sister got very ill, uh, as she mentioned, and uh, started hemodialysis, and that was a different kind of creature for her. It was much harder on her, so uh, she elected to uh, follow up on a transplant then. Unfortunately, that attempt was halted because of me. Um, my husband had gotten very ill. My mother also had gotten very ill. I had to go back to work full time. I was the sole uh, breadwinner for the family. Um, so uh, the psychiatrist thought it would be best to delay it. So then we went to attempt number three, uh, at which point my mother became ill and uh, was made palliative shortly thereafter. So we had to nurse her until she passed away. By the fourth attempt, both Julia and Helen were emotionally ready for the transplant, but life threw them another curve. Julia had a cancer scare. And on Mother's Day, I got the great news that it was not cancer, and we were back on track for another transplant attempt. And uh, finally, uh, in August of 2012, I got a kidney from my wonderful sister. It took 15 years, but we finally did it. <laughs> you were a bit concerned about having it done? I was very concerned because um, I'm somewhat of a hypochondriac. I hate going to see the doctor. Um, so I was pretty scared. And uh, it actually was a lot easier than I expected. I thought it would be much more painful, and it wasn't. Uh, in fact, I had almost virtually no pain medication other than a little bit of Tylenol. Uh, after the surgery and uh, aside from some fatigue for maybe the first couple of weeks while that lone kidney adjusted to doing the work for the two kidneys, um, I was perfectly, perfectly fine. I think that's an important part of the process that the transplant team ensures that you're ready for the transplant both physically and mentally. You do have to be not just physically fit but mentally fit because you know it's all fine if everything goes well but I think it would be very, it could be very devastating if something were to go wrong, if somebody were to die or if the transplant didn't take. Um, so I think you have to be in a good place to be able to handle any of that. Um, so I know back on the second attempt, I, if, it, if something had gone wrong, I, I wouldn't have been able to deal with that very well. So I was lucky that they did hold off on it. And I too did not want to pressure her it was all in her hands sort of thing. Because what if something did happen? I would just be, be devastated too. Uh, I still have that in the back of my mind. So tell us a little bit about what the kidney transplant has, how it's changed your life. Gosh, it's like getting out of jail free from the Monopoly game, you know? I can do absolutely, within reason, uh, absolutely everything. And I understand you've just come back from a wonderful trip. This was the first time I went uh, with my husband to New York that I did not have to make arrangements for any kind of medications to be delivered, any kind of uh, appointments that I had to schedule for dialysis. Just get up, pack, and go and enjoy it. I didn't do that for the last uh, 16 years because uh, I couldn't. I had to be somewhere every second day or else it would shorten my life. Problem now is we can never find her because she's always gallivanting around the city. So. That's right, my kids phone, Mom, you're never home. You're right, I have 16 years to catch up on and I'm gonna try and do it. What she's given me is priceless and I can never repay her. Laboratory Technologists is the regulatory body responsible for monitoring professional standards and conduct for medical lab technologists in Manitoba. Medical lab technologists perform investigations on specimens used by other healthcare professions in the diagnosis, treatment, and prevention of disease. MLTs must maintain competencies and conform to ongoing education to be registered with the College, the College of Medical Laboratory Technologists of Manitoba. Patient protection is our concern. If you're like most people, you may not always be comfortable asking your health care provider questions. You may be afraid to speak out or not understand medical terms. You may find healthcare settings scary or be too ill to speak for yourself. 
Any of these may prevent you from getting the best care you need. That's where a patient advocate can help, someone who acts on your behalf to promote your needs and wishes. Advocate for someone you know or love and ask someone you trust to be your advocate before the need arises. SafeToAsk.ca can help you learn more about patient advocates and how you can help make healthcare as safe as possible. Learn to be safe. An exciting innovation is the Living Donor Parrot Exchange Program. This is where you have a living donor uh, who wants to donate to you. They're very keen to donate to you, but they're not blood group compatible or they're not tissue compatible because you have antibodies against them. Um, and what we used to have to say to that individual is, I'm sorry, you can't be a donor. Uh, and so many times, because it only, you only happen to have one living donor who's a possibility, uh, saying no meant that you had to go onto the wait list and you'd have to wait another five years. And in some provinces, the wait time is up as far as eight or ten years, right? So um, having a living donor that's not compatible actually means a very prolonged time on dialysis in some situations. Um, what we've developed is a way of, through a, a matching uh, program, so it's really a computerized program, we take all of these pairs that are incompatible, that are willing to, to trade donors, uh, we put them into what's called the Paired Exchange Registry, and every three months we would run a, an analysis and find out, uh, is there somebody who could donate to you and your donor could donate to somebody else? Jennifer and her fiance, Rick, have been accepted into the Paired Exchange program. The Parrot Exchange program dramatically increases Jennifer's chances of finding a compatible kidney. You made a decision to sign up for the Parrot Exchange program. Was that a difficult decision for you? I made that decision a couple of years ago. We knew that it was coming when we first heard about the program. And for Jen, because like, I mean, I can help her and someone else live a normal life and get married soon. I hope if we can get this done right. So. The Parrot Exchange Program and Jennifer's increased chances of finding a compatible kidney means everything to Rick and Jennifer. It means that Jennifer can finally receive a kidney and be, live healthy, you know, and live a healthy life. We can do stuff. Every day there's somebody dying waiting for an organ senselessly and uh, it hurts, hurts to, to know about it, you know. I try not to get emotional. Thinking about you is bad enough and then other people, strangers, you know, it's, it's hard. Dr. Kent Hayglass is a professor at the U of M. He's also a kidney transplant recipient. He was first diagnosed in 2000, and after seven years, he was in end-stage renal disease. So I'm doing all the things you're supposed to do, but in truth, looking back, things get a little bit worse every month, every year. Um, your energy drops, your ability to concentrate. Uh, one of the first organs to, to, uh, to function poorly when you have kidney disease, I discovered, is your brain which surprised me, but I guess because it's your most sophisticated organ, it makes sense to be the fussiest about being in a healthy body. So slowly things go downhill, yeah. You obviously have a sophisticated job. You're involved in research. Yes, I do research, actually, ironically, in immunology, which is how your body fights disease. Uh, the main way in which immunology works is by finding anything that's foreign and destroying it. So if what's foreign is getting a cold, getting the flu, having a parasite, you say is wonderful, your body's destroying it. The challenge is if you've got a transplanted organ, your body wants to destroy that as well. So yeah, it's kind of interesting the way things worked out in life. As you say, quite ironic. Yeah. So you're at work and you're starting to find that your brain isn't functioning as well. You're not as sharp as you Definitely, were. Definitely, yeah. And you really noticed this, did you? Oh yeah, it's, it's pretty obvious, yeah. You're also much more tired. I mean, the fatigue becomes quite considerable. At first, Kent's sister, who lives in Toronto, was keen to become his kidney donor. When his sister was unable to be his donor, Kent's wife, Sandy, volunteered to try, despite the fact that they had no genetic commonality. And actually, she went through the tests. She's in excellent shape, and still is, by the way. A lot of people still ask her at work, so how are you, as if expecting something terrible would happen. It's been five and a half years, and she's in fabulous shape, as am I, as you can tell. 
So maybe you can tell us what it meant to you when your wife said to you, Kent, I'd like to be your donor if that's possible. I guess my best and, and rather feeble effort at describing it is, is uh, excitement. We'll have a lot more years of happy life together and being able to do things, an incredible sense of freedom, a sense of regaining your life. Uh, as you get to the last stages of kidney disease, you become very, very passive. Just watch the world go by and it's like, oh well, I guess that's it. And uh, that's not a nice place to be. Um, very rapidly after a transplant, suddenly you're part of the world again. And so that's the biggest gift I could possibly imagine. The nurses in the transplant ward uh, were happy to share with us that she wasn't, wouldn't need to buy me Valentine's Day cards for some time in the future, and I think they've got a good point. The hay glasses still find that people are surprised with their story, surprised that they were compatible. So there were a lot of people afterwards, including some people, not nephrologists, but others in the medical profession, who said, oh, I didn't know you and your wife were compatible, meaning genetically, of course, because um, we'd proved the social compatibility already. And, uh, and of course, we're not. Her genes are totally different than mine, uh, but the progress in different types of medications that have come along are such that that's really no longer very important. That's really a remarkable accomplishment, and it comes from basic research that others have done. Much of his family is in Toronto. And so their first question was, would I be coming to U of T for a transplant? And uh, so I didn't have many laughs in those days, but that was one that I did have. Um, and I pointed out that actually the University of Manitoba and the nephrology and the transplant Manitoba program is actually one of the top three in all of Canada. So actually this has among the very best uh, clinical care and research. They've just combined those two very effectively um, in the entire country and it's well known internationally. When I go to Europe, when I go to Asia, my main area of research is not transplant, but people still bring it up because it's so well known here. Dr. Rush is proud of the Transplant Manitoba program, the innovations and the contributions to research. The uh, first uh, kidney transplant in Manitoba was done in the late 60s. Uh, in 1969 by the sort of father of nephrology in Manitoba, Dr. Ashley Thompson. There has been a steady uh, growth, obviously, of the program uh, since then. When I arrived in Manitoba in 82, I think we had about 150 patients. We now have 600. So there has been a steady growth in, in the program. Um, I'm happy to be able to say that uh, uh, Winnipeg has been uh, very, uh, not only up to date, but has uh, been a pioneer in a number of uh, uh, issues related to transplantation that uh, I think quite uh, honestly I'm proud of the team of uh, physicians and surgeons and personnel generally in the program because it, it has a very good reputation. He is confident that when he leaves, he's leaving the transplant program in very capable hands. That's what uh, Head always wants to do is leave people behind that are better and better and better and to improve uh, things in the future. Before we leave you today, I'd like to invite you all to consider becoming a living kidney donor. Imagine if someone watching the program today could be a match for Jennifer. It's easy to do. Just contact Transplant Manitoba and you could save a life.